Morning. It's really good to be back here, back home, here with you at uh, Forge Road Bible Chapel. Lots of things have happened since we were here last summer. So much has changed uh, quickly, too. But it's good to know that the, uh, the Lord doesn't change and that he's with us today and wherever we're gathered, you know, folks gathered watching from home. Hi, folks. I know there are some uh, from Antioch who will be watching this morning as well, and they send their greetings and blessings. Well, I want to um, start by reading from Matthew 28 and verse 18. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We know these verses. It's a great commission. We know them to be uh, powerful and comforting, powerful and comforting uh, words from the Lord Jesus. Over the years, we've discussed these words a lot. Uh, we've talked about missions from, from verse 19, baptism. Uh, if we're saved, we know what it means to have him always. And we know that uh, to keep the commandments of Jesus is to love him. All these uh, important and cherished things have been discussed, and we'll talk about them again. But for today, I want you to look closely at verse 19, just a little to the right of the word baptizing. And, and to the left of the uh, father and son, you'll see four little words there in the name of. That's what we're going to be talking about this morning. That's what we're going to be uh, talking about today, and, and specifically in the name of Jesus. We're going to be talking about uh, what that means, and um, we'll look at a passage where in the name of Jesus is at the center of what's going on. We'll hit a, a bunch of uh, passages around the New Testament, and, um, and then we'll draw out a challenge and some encouragement as Norris, Norris prayed for us this morning in, in order to do any of this, we'll definitely need to ask the Lord's help again. So let's do that right now. Dear Lord, uh, what a privilege it is to open your word, um, to peer into the truth, to, to get a glimpse of Jesus, who in, in the word gives us a glimpse of you. And it's a privilege, Lord, uh, by no means could we ever exhaust, even though we would meet every week. Lord, bless this week that uh, your name would be honored and that we would get a better understanding of what that means. In Jesus' name, amen. What is it to, to do something or, or speak in the name of? In church or at a meal? We'll end a prayer in the name of Jesus. That might be uh, probably the most common use of all. And, and although, uh, although it's common, I think many of us don't even know why we say that or what it actually means. But it's pretty common for us to do that. Um, another common example uh, is at baptism. We follow the Lord's instruction in baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Uh, those are uh, just a couple examples from inside the church. Outside the church, you'll have a harder time finding examples. Uh, you might hear a report um, that someone donated a large sum of money in someone's name. Um, they do that to honor a person. Maybe the most uh, common use in society has to do with uh, the identity theft commercials I hear all the time. People who would steal your identity and, and uh, you know, borrow that money um, borrow money in your name and use your assets in your name. 
hope that ha hasn't happened to any of you. <laughs> so this use uh, speaks of ownership. There's an older phrase, uh, stop in the name of the law. I haven't heard that much lately. Or open up in the name of the law. Using uh, the name of here speaks of authority and power. So at least in these examples, this phrase is, is somewhat versatile. Uh, it can speak of honor, ownership, power, or authority. And despite these examples, this phrase isn't really part of our common everyday conversation. But in the Bible, however, this phrase is very common. How common? Well, it's, it's in the Old Testament. I don't know how often, but if we just focus on the New Testament, we find five Greek words that translate into the English word name. Name appears about 200 times, and, and half of those occurrences, 97 times, it's this in the name of phrase. That's pretty common. And if you're like me after today, you'll, you'll pick up your Bible and, and you'll be noticing it everywhere. It's in all parts of the New Testament. Uh, it's more common in the Gospels than in the Epistles. It's, uh, it's used of all kinds of people, but most of the time it's, it's used in relation to the Lord Jesus. So there's lots of passages we could choose from to uh, get into this. Um, but there's one place in the New Testament where this phrase um, is at the center of all the action, maybe more than anywhere else in the, in the Bible, and that's at Acts chapter 3. You can turn to Acts chapter 3, but you're going to want to put a marker down because we'll be moving in and out of this passage a lot. Acts, uh, Acts comes after the, uh, the Gospels and before the letters of the New Testament. And to summarize how this chapter hangs in the context of the Bible, we turn to none other than the Lord Jesus himself, who says, in John chapter 16, verse 5, but now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Acts chapter 1, Jesus departs. Acts chapter 2, he sends the helper. The Lord mentions the ad advantage of the Holy Spirit, and we see that in all of Acts chapter 2. But after reading through the excitement of Pentecost, look just before Acts 3 at, at, at chapter 2 and verse 46. Chapter 2, verse 46. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. Doesn't get much better than that. Not on this side of heaven. Those were some good days. Results, advantages of the Holy Spirit's coming. It was uh, just as the Lord had said. It's to your advantage I go away and that the helper comes. That's clearly seen in the church, but it's also seen in the individual lives of Peter and John. Look at uh, Acts 3, verse 1. Now, Peter and John went up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. This is, this is new Peter, and this is a new John going into the temple, heading straight into enemy territory. The, the temple is, is where they're almost certain to run into those who hated Jesus. That's not how they were before the Spirit came. These guys used to run and hide when there was danger. Matthew chapter 26, uh, verse 26 says, Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. It's all of them. And you'll remember how Peter denied knowing the Lord Jesus. He got a little salty with curses, you know, when confronted by that really intimidating slave girl. Peter was afraid, terrified. But here, boldly marching straight into the enemy, enemy territory, fearlessly proclaiming that name all along the way. Verse 2, And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried when they laid daily at the, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. Well, this lame man is somewhat familiar to us. Uh, this, this man is... Uh, 
you know, like the folks standing around the medians, you see, with a cup and a sign asking for money. Uh, depending on your routine, your travels from work, you know, you might get to know the faces of these people and uh, maybe even recognize them as, as having been in the same spot before. That was this man. Verse 3, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms and fixing his eyes on him with Peter, uh, John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting something, expecting to re receive something from them. And Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. There it is. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Verse 7, and he, and he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. This man uh, went from being unable to walk his whole life to some kind of athletic guy, you know, leaping up, walking and leaping, praising God. It was immediate and full healing. Verse 9, and all the people saw him walking and praising God. And then they knew it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. He was that uh, familiar beggar. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. Well, one thing to note is, is there's no evidence of, of anything being planned here. This, this event is not planned or scripted in any way. I know that um, some of us spend a, a great deal of time preparing for a message that this was just the two guys going about their business and running into this opportunity. This, this whole thing comes to them in an instant, and sometimes that's the way the Lord works through us, you know? The Lord does great things through them. Look at the, the results from chapter 4 and verse 4. It says, 5,000 men believed. The message happens because of the healing, but, but the 5,000 being saved, that's because of the work of God in those people through Peter's message. And uh, though we have an amazing healing of an individual here, what follows this message is in a sense a greater healing as this may be the single biggest healing recorded in, in all of Israel. 5,000 men healed, spiritually that is. Let's read this sermon. Verse 11, Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power and godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One, and the just, and ask for a murderer to be granted to you, and killed the prince of life, life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, the Christ, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that time, times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. This is a great sermon. And like any great sermon, notice that Jesus is at the center of the message. Look at verse 16. And his name through faith in his name, has made this man strong. Jesus is at the center of uh, Peter's message, and uh, his name was at the healing, the means of the healing. His name is at the center of this whole chapter, and, and that's true on into uh, chapter 4 as well as we've seen. Look at uh, 4 verse 2. The people in charge, they were greatly disturbed that Peter and John taught in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And um, they ask in, in verse 7, by what name have you done this? 
And then in verses uh, 10 through 12, Peter makes it very clear. This was done in Jesus' name. His name is the issue here. His name and faith in his name is the issue beyond Acts and throughout all of the New Testament, on into church history. His name and faith in his name is, is that issue in our world today, even in our lives this morning. But what does it mean? What does it mean to do things and speak in Jesus' name? I'm going to give you three things that we uh, can draw out from this passage in Acts to answer that. Number one, in Jesus' name means the real Jesus. Look at verse 13. God's servant, Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go, but you denied the Holy One and just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. When this was written, the name of Jesus was common. There were lots of people with the first name Jesus. But this message uh, IDs the real Jesus on a number of points, and we'll look at five of these. The first is, this is the Jesus you delivered up. Now, people hearing this message, they'll, they'll know whose blood they cried out for. They'll know. They'll know who that was. Two, this is the Jesus you delivered up to Pilate. The, senten the sentencing came through an official in, in government set in a particular place at a particular time. Three, this Jesus is the one Pilate was determined to let go. I'd be surprised if Pilate was ever concerned for the fate of anyone the Jews brought before him. So this, this Jesus would be unusual and memorable to Pilate. For this Jesus is the one you swapped out for a murderer by name, Barabbas. And uh, if that wasn't enough to ID this Jesus, five, he's the one God raised from the dead, of which there were many witnesses, Peter and John among them. That's five tangible earthly points of ID that allow the rulers and the people to know exactly which Jesus is being talked about here. You know, today our job isn't any easier than it was then. In fact, it's probably harder. Not because people are, are, are walking around with the name Jesus, but because of Antichrist and false teachings that are so confusing. It's harder than ever to know which Jesus people are actually talking about. We need the, the Jesus of the Bible more than ever before, and, and we need him to be separated out, set apart, sanctified. Um, we need his name to be hallowed as it is. So today, it's, uh, it's just like Paul imagined. There were those who, who would come preaching another Jesus, corrupting the minds, deceiving them from the simplicity that is in Christ with a different spirit, a, a different gospel. Sometimes they preach a, a half Jesus or a partial Jesus. And, and to the untaught and to the weak, that partial Jesus is just the nice guy in the paintings, embracing children, never turning anyone away, never judgmental, completely void of anything controversial, and always up with the latest social trends. You notice that? That false Jesus is what the world likes. The world doesn't want the whole Jesus. You and I do. We'll be spending our whole lives trying to understand, trying to grow in the knowledge to know the fullness of Jesus. And, and we'll be getting to know him more and more all of our lives and beyond. And we're not satisfied with that. We also want the whole world to know him. And we're not satisfied with that. We want each other to know him more, praying for one another as Paul did, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory, may give the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, Ephesians 1. It's at the core why we go to church, do Bible study. That's what we want. We want more of the real Jesus, not less, not some watered-down version that appeals to the dead. That's another Jesus whom we have not preached. So when we say in Jesus' name, we're saying the distinct preeminent one, the God-man, not open to your truth, but he is truth. Jesus Christ come from God the Father as the very image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, by whom all things were created, by before all things, in whom 
all things consist, our Savior, and many, many other names in the New Testament, in all of Scripture. <coughs> so what does it mean to, to do things and speak in the name of Jesus? Well, <coughs> it means the real Jesus, the whole Jesus. <coughs> 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 Excuse me. Does anybody have any water? <clears throat> I guess I should have been wearing my mask. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> it means the, the real Jesus, the whole Jesus. <clears throat> Thank you. As revealed in his word, the Bible. The second thing speaking and, and doing things in the name of Jesus means <clears throat> is trouble. Look at Acts 4. Verse 5, it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas, the, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. Sounds like a tough crowd. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power, by what name have you done this? Peter's on trial. Peter and John, they spent the night in jail, and now they're on trial. For what? A good deed done to a helpless man? What's the problem with that? Everyone appreciates kindness to the infirm, to the disabled. The world praises organizations dedicated to working with help, helpless people. You don't have a problem with a good deed done to a helpless man. The problem is by what means this man has been made well. The problem is... This was done in Jesus' name. That's offensive to the world, no matter how miraculous, big-hearted, or, or beautiful a thing is. If you bring the real Jesus into it, you might end up on trial. And you may even be judged for a good deed done in Jesus' name. Why is that? Why are people so up in arms about the real Jesus? Well, if I refer you to point one, I'll refer you to point one. The whole person, people hate the real Jesus. Back in Bible times, they hated him for how he challenged the false, the false religious systems. It made him so mad that they wanted him dead. And if they had their way, he, he wouldn't have made it to the cross. He would have died under a big pile of rocks. Today, it's not so much the, the people in the religious systems that hate Jesus. It's the secular culture. They hate him because of what he says about sexual immorality, greed, pride, hum, uh, humility repentance, forgiveness, or anything that doesn't support the trendy narratives. So 2,000 years later, there's still conflict over things done in Jesus' name. But it's no surprise to us. He told us there'd be trouble. And Matthew, you can turn to Matthew chapter 10, thank you, and, and verse 34 I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. John 15, 18 says, they will persecute us, and all this they, they will do for what? Why? Why will they persecute us? Verse 21, for my name's sake. So what do we do? What do we do with Jesus' name, knowing there will be trouble? Colossians 3.17 says, In word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God for the Father by him. That's what we do. On the flip side, drop the name of Jesus and you'll be fine. Nobody will bother you and you'll be considered a really talented, kind, and interesting person on your own merits. But if we're like Peter and John, if, if, if we act and speak in the name of Jesus, we will be on trial. In fact, we'll always perpetually be on trial revelation 12 says there's an accuser of the brethren before god night and day it's an amazing scene to imagine in heaven our worst enemy hurling both truthful and false accusations before the righteous judge of the universe it's good to know that we have an advocate in jesus part of the reason he had to go part of the reason he had to leave was so that he could be that advocate, always making intercession for us. The real Jesus is not ashamed 
to associate, not ashamed to be our advocate and defend us before the Father. But imagine for a moment that he, he wasn't there for us. That's terrifying to me. To think of no Jesus before the righteous judge to defend, but instead agreeing with the, with the charges, at least some of them. I don't know about you, but to think of the Father and the Son and Satan agreeing on anything shakes me, but to agree on my guilt? That's terrifying. And that's the case for those who don't believe. We should be terrified for them because their trial will be different from anything the children of God might face here on earth for proclaiming Jesus' name. Which brings me to another point. We do and speak in the name of Jesus for those who don't believe. It's sort of an evangelical aspect because there's no advocate for those who believe another gospel or another Jesus. Those people will be condemned for the rest, with the rest. And that drives us to, uh, to preach in Jesus' name. Matthew uh, 7 says, Many will say, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And you'll say, Depart from me, I never knew you. These folks didn't, uh, they didn't do it in Jesus' name. They, they thought they had it right. People think they're working in the name of Jesus, but it's of their own imagination. They never knew the real Jesus, and the, never, and, the, and the real Jesus never knew them. There's some here who don't know the real Jesus. I know uh, I speak for all Christians when I say, please don't go on anymore without knowing him. Don't get denied. The Lord said in Matthew 10, 32, deny me and I'll deny you. Deny me before men and I will deny you before my father who's in heaven. So there's the challenge to our faith. If we uh, really believe this stuff, then one of the biggest manifestations, one of the greatest manifestations of that faith is what we see here in, in Acts 3. Good deeds done in the name of Jesus despite the persecution, despite the trouble, the trial. So in the name of Jesus means readily accepting any trouble that might come from associating with him. There's uh, places in the New Testament that speak of that even being a joy. <laughs> May I get there, Lord. May I get to that point in my walk. One more thing that uh, in Jesus' name means is uh, look to him and not me. Look at uh, verse 12 of chapter 3. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why, so look, int why look so intently as at us, as though, as if, as if by our own power or by our own godliness we made this man walk? Peter did the healing. He willed it. He initiated the whole thing, but he makes it clear who's responsible. This was done in the name of Jesus. And that's, that's a challenge we in, in the real church all face. How do we handle the good the Lord has done within us and through us? Would we allow anyone to believe our goodness was done in our own name? As if, as though, this is... Do you withhold the true answer for the hope within? Do you conveniently replace that hope with self? self-determination or, or just some nice thing we inherited from our parents and worked into our own loveliness of person? How could we do anything in the name of our own goodness? I, I thought our gospel acknowledged that there is nothing good in me. If I really believe that, then it's not me, it's him and his work in my life. I know I'm guilty. <laughs> guilty of having uh, drawn on the riches <clears throat> of the Father's resources from the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe I've drawn on that power to do good and to be good, only to leave out the name of Jesus. Maybe it was too inconvenient, you know, maybe it felt like others would praise me more, I don't know. But everything in me, and any good thing I have, every good thing in me is due to him alone. What do we do? with the name of Jesus, Peter shows us. Look at uh, chapter four, verse eight. Then Peter, 
filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made whole, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man stands before you whole. Peter could have been talking about himself here. I could be talking about me here. He wasn't. He was clearly talking about the lame man, but he could have been talking about himself or you or me. By what means have you been made whole? By what means are you being made whole? By what means are you partaking in making others whole? It's through him. Whew, may we be as bold as Peter and, and John, making the, the means of our salvation clear in Jesus' name. Well, that's the, the challenge from this passage, to do and to speak in the name of Jesus. That's, that's our challenge as Christians in the world, a world that doesn't want to hear it. <clears throat> I hope this helps uh, answer the question what it means to speak in, in the name of Jesus. Um, I'd like to, as promised, close with some encouragement. There's a lot of challenge there. Um, years ago when we lived in Baltimore County, I remember driving home from work and as I approached um, my house, you know, at the end of a, a long hard work day, I remember just being bewildered by the sight of a guy in my, my yard mowing my grass. <laughs> What? Startled and, and, and curious. I remember thinking, what did I, did this guy just, you know, he was like mowing his own lawn. He wandered in my, my yard with his lawnmower. Did, did I let, or did, you know, did I let the grass get too high? Did it get too long? Why, why is he doing that? No, it wasn't too long. It turned out that uh, it was my, my neighbor, Mike. And, and Mike's, you know, I said, I said, hey, what's going on? What are you doing? Did I let the grass get too high? He says, he says, no, I just wanted to do something nice for you guys. Wow. <laughs> that was hard. I think it would have been easier if he was like irritated with me. You know, I'm just mowing this because you're not, you know. Yeah, but it wasn't like that. Mike, Mike was actually doing this, you know, loving his neighbor as himself thing, literally, you know. <laughs> you might think, well, that's really nice. Why did that upset you, Jason? Well, the reason why it was hard for me was, is because Mike's an agnostic. Mike has never darkened, nor maybe never will darken the, the threshold of a church. That troubled me. You know, Mike is uh, known around the neighborhood, or was known around the neighborhood, as, as being a really great guy, always doing little things for people. But I'm, I'm never going to just go over somebody's yard and start mowing the grass. You know, I'm not going to do that. And I remember thinking, what, what kind of Christian am I? What is the power of God in my life if, if, if the agnostics are better at loving their neighbors than me? It was, uh, what is, what is it, the thought, a thought bomb, yeah. It was a thought bomb, you know. You ever feel that way? Like, like when Bill Gates gives like some $30 billion to charity? We'll never come close. Well, as with all questions that might trouble a believer, the answer is in his word. For me, it was actually studying this chapter, Acts 3, that I realized what really matters is not the quality or quantity of a good thing, but whether or not Jesus is in it. Because although Mike, he did for people what was probably better than anything I could do, one thing is for sure, he could never do anything big or small in Jesus' name. Only a child of God can do that. And because of what that means, even something as simple as a cup of cold water given in Jesus' name qualifies for an eternal reward. That takes the, the comparatively small kindnesses uh, of the believer to a pretty high level, doesn't it? Isn't the Lord gracious? He takes a, a heavy burden. He makes it light. And then he rewards us as if we've done something great. What a gracious God we have. I've got a few minutes left. I want to close um, with just reading 
without comment, Matthew chapter 25, starting in, in, in verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when, when did we see you hungry and feed you? or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or, or naked and clothe you? When, when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Should I close in prayer? Okay, okay, let's, let's, let's pray. Oh, Lord, it's so good to know you. Um, thank you for making it possible. Thank you for that person in our lives that, uh, that came with the gospel, that came bearing Jesus' name, that cared enough to do that for us, to, to bear his name without being ashamed, ready and willing to take the trouble that comes with, with knowing and preaching the real Jesus. Uh, help us this week as we go out. Help us to do little things in the name of Jesus, not worried about how small they are or how big they are, but do all in the name of Jesus, giving honor to you. Help us to, um, help us to be safe this week and um, be bearing this name as, as a light, as a beacon in a, in a really confused and fallen world that doesn't seem to be getting any better. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.